With Lecture 9, we rarely hit much more solid archaeological ground. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the first settlement of Europe by modern humans, known commonly to archaeologists as Cro-Magnons. And this first settlement took place sometime shortly after 45,000 years ago. The compass of this lecture is about 45,000 to 15,000 years before present. We're really beginning to narrow the chronological span of the topics we talk about here. This lecture begins with a discussion of the cognitive fluidity which gave modern humans advantages over much more archaic people. We're then going to describe the European environment during the late Ice Age, the distinctive technology developed by Cro-Magnons which were part of their adaptation to this very challenging environment. And then we'll talk about the first settlement itself between about 45 and 38,000 years ago. In this lecture, we're going to, so going to stress that the Neanderthals survived alongside the newcomers for about five to 10,000 years. And then we'll describe the important developments which took hold in Cro-Magnon society, one of the first human societies which brought together the living and the spiritual worlds. And finally, we'll analyze some of the general features of Cro-Magnon society and its economic basis. Last time, I emphasized that there was this sudden cognitive explosion, if that's the right word, in humanity somewhere around 70,000 years ago. This is one of the big debates of archaeology at the moment. When did humans acquire the full cognitive abilities and potential that we have today? Most people seem to think it was before 50,000 years ago, maybe 70,000. But we do know that after 50,000 years ago, there were a series of rapid cultural explosions in southwestern Asia and later in Europe. Both of these being areas where the original breeding populations of modern humans may not have exceeded 50 people, or at the most, a few hundred individuals. Another interesting point about this, there was rapid cultural change in one area, but not in others. For example, the blade technology, which I talked about last time, which developed in southwestern Asia, these parallel-sided flakes, which really are blades, first developed in southwestern Asia. The earliest known art appeared in Europe. Australia was settled sometime after 40,000 years, perhaps 35,000 years before present. The important thing is that only after 30,000 years ago, which really is somewhat of a baseline date in prehistory, did rapid cultural change take hold in all parts of the Old World and considerably later in the Americas. By this time, humankind had the ability to bring together the natural and social worlds in a synthesis which is characteristic of many human societies today. In many societies, human existence is lived surrounded by the forces of a little understood symbolic world. And the spiritual and the living material worlds flow one into the other, giving explanations, contexts for day-to-day -day existence. It is as if you were in a medieval chapel and moving from the main nave into the outside, the, a medieval cathedral, I should say, moving from the nave into the chapels at the outskirts and coming back into the middle. Tremendous cognitive fluidity, a flexibility, which gave modern humans a compelling advantage over more archaic people. The environmental setting was very challenging. As we said in the Neanderthal lecture, the Neanderthals lived at a time of extreme cold. But this wasn't cold all the time. There were constant fluctuations and frequent short periods of much more temperate conditions. Until about 50,000 years ago, the cold was extreme. But then it warmed up for a while. The winters were slightly less severe, maybe the summers a bit longer, maybe annual temperatures a bit warmer. 
And this was the period when the first modern humans appeared in Southeast Europe, then in Central, and then in Western. This more temperate period is only a relative term. It was still extremely cold. The environment was very challenging, with short, relatively warm summers, but constant fluctuations from one year to the next, and violent variations between the seasons, with many months of sub-zero temperatures. This was an extremely challenging environment, and must have required new artifacts and much more hunting, sophisticated hunting skills. And this is where modern humans really came into their own. Because you see, they had the cognitive ability to plan, to think through problems, and to come up with ingenious solutions. And what they came up with was a technology which I always describe as being very similar to that of the familiar Swiss Army knife, or the Leatherman. A idea that you made carefully shaped cores, fine-grained rock, and then you took a punch and you struck off a series of relatively standard-sized punch-struck blades, long parallel-sided blades, maybe about this long, and with all these standardized blanks, blanks you could then produce all sorts of different tools. Think of a Swiss Army knife. Basically, it's a chassis with strong hinges. And to these hinges you attach knife blades, corkscrews, borers, saws, scissors even, and all these different tools which are used for different purposes. You put it in your pocket and you use it. Think of the Cro-Magnon technology in stone as being the same. For example, they produced, or from these blades, backed knives. They produced some very lethally sharp points, which were probably mounted on the end of spears. They produced all kinds of scrapers. But above all, they produced a chisel, a burin, as archaeologists call it, which is a blade with a chiseled end, a little spool is removed from the end, giving you a small, rather sharp chisel end. This had one priceless use. It enabled people to cut longitudinal grooves in reindeer antler, or in bone. And what they would do is cut the long grooves in the hard outside surface of the antler, fresh antler, which is easily worked, then they would lever these long splinters out and make a whole range of weapons and other tools in antler and bone. And here immediately is a major difference with the earlier archaic humans like the Neanderthals. They were using the full potential of bone and antler. This enabled them to produce an extraordinary range of highly effective artifacts. For example, razor-sharp antler spear points, which could be mounted in four shafts, and then the four shaft mounted on the shaft of a spear, or a spear point simply mounted in a spear, which were extremely sharp, much lighter, easily propelled. And then they would produce also harpoons, which are barbed points, detachable spear points, attached to shafts with a thong, as often today used commonly with sea mammals, where you hit the animal and then you have got a line attached to it, and a weapon called the spear thrower. Now you will recall that earlier in the course we pointed out how difficult it is to hunt animals with spears because you have to get really close to the animal and you have to stalk it. You literally have to look it in the eyes before you can thrust your spear, hopefully, into a vulnerable point. With a spear thrower, you can be extremely accurate and stand off a little further. Also, you can propel, because the spear thrower is literally a piece of bone or wood with a hook on the end, and you simply go whoosh, like that. You flick it. You get much greater velocity from your spear, greater penetrating power, and more range. This was a major innovation. 
second only to, ultimately, the bow and arrow, which came later. But probably the most important innovation in bone and antler was a small, inconspicuous artifact whose existence we've already talked about a little bit, and that is the eyed needle. Small, made of bone, ivory, little hole bored in the top with a fine flint awl. In that hole you thread, and then, having done that, you can fashion multi-layered, tailored, cold-weather clothing. It's funny, for years, People didn't really think about layered clothing. And then about the 1960s and 70s, particularly with the release of polar fleece, people began to think about wearing layered clothing, climbing mountains, hiking, sailing, whatever you want. The Cro-Magnons were well aware of layered clothing, as indeed were the Inuit and Eskimo in more modern times, because they worked in extreme sub-zero temperature outside, there were sharp temperature changes, and this sort of clothing is ideal for this. Furthermore, by sewing you could combine different hides and different skins, for example the fur of an arctic fox, into such items as boots and the heads, the uh, hoods of anoraks. Because these different furs have different qualities. Some are waterproof, some insulate well against cold, and so on. The important thing about tailored clothing was that it enabled people to live out in the open year-round. On the Arctic semi periglacial plains north of the more sheltered areas of southern Europe, the vast steppe tundra which covered Europe and Eurasia, they could settle there living in houses which we'll describe in a subsequent lecture, but venturing out in the coldest weather and still being warm and relatively comfortable. They were not just wearing skins like the Cro-Magna, like the Neanderthals did. This was a major inconspicuous revolution in human technology. When then did the first modern humans arrive in Eastern Europe? The answer is we're not absolutely sure. But we suspect it was around 45,000 years ago. These were round-headed, completely modern people, known to anthropologists as Cro-Magnons. After the Cro-Magnon rock shelter, which was found in 1868 during the construction of a railroad station near the small village of Les Aisy in southwestern France, which is a major center of Cro-Magnon research. We know, and all these dates come from radiocarbon dating, a method which is widely used for later prehistory and described in your guide. The Cro-Magnons, we know from these carbon dates, had settled in Western Europe somewhere around 38,000 years ago. In other words, the spread into Europe by prehistoric standards, was probably fairly rapid. Again, it was this natural process of expansion. For some five to 10,000 years, they seemed to be living alongside a slowly shrinking Neanderthal population. As we've said several times, these people didn't interbreed with Neanderthals. That if, uh, any modern analogies are correct, they probably pushed the Neanderthals out into more marginal areas and they eventually became extinct. By between 30 and 31,000 years ago, the Cro-Magnons had Europe to themselves. What was this Europe like? It was very different from today. Huge ice sheets mantled Scandinavia and the Alps spreading out onto the plains surrounding. Huge ice sheets may have also formed in the Pyrenees between France and Spain. A broad zone of treeless rolling plains extended from the Atlantic coast deep into Eastern Europe and Eurasia and all the way out into Siberia. 
The Atlantic Ocean was 300 feet below modern levels. The British Isles were part of the continent. The Southern North Sea was under ice. The most sheltered locales were deep river valleys in southwestern France, also in parts of Austria and also parts of northern Spain. We think that these were the areas where many Cro-Magnon groups wintered. And then in the summer, they would follow the summer migrations of reindeer and other animals onto the open plains to the north. Some fascinating research is beginning to track the migrations of reindeer north and south at different seasons of the year. Like the Neanderthals, but probably with far more sophisticated hunting methods, the Cro-Magnons followed and concentrated on a smaller range of beasts, although they were capable of hunting anything, and the reindeer was particularly important in their lives. The study of the Cro-Magnons has been going on at a hard pace ever since the 1870s, mainly in the hands of French archaeologists, who have identified a long series of Ice Age cultures, as it were, in Western Europe, which are of little more interest than purely locally. What we can concentrate on here, though, are not the names of these cultures, many of which had a rather limited distribution and are based on differences in artifacts, but to discuss some of the significant changes which affected European society after 30,000 years ago. These general trends are far more important for the purposes of studying human prehistory. One thing happened in some areas. Population densities rose. There was much more contact between neighbors. There were much more closely defined territorial boundaries as a result. This was important because you're dealing with issues like the number of people per square mile the land can support. At the same time, hunting technologies had evolved rapidly. Humans were now extremely skilled, adept hunters, capable of taking almost any animal at any time of the year, although obviously there were some animals that they avoided. The cave bear in particular was a formidable prey, and it is thought that in fact people were so effective at hunting them that they rapidly became very scarce and eventually vanished. But most hunting involved following seasonal migrations of animals like reindeer and bison. And as we will see, with the first settlement of the Americas. This sort of situation involves people in having contact with others because they were moving a great deal on a fairly predictable pattern following the migrations of reindeer which would change from one year to the next. But at the same time other people were doing this as well. And they began to have more contact, probably to engage in cooperative game drives, cooperative culls of reindeer herds, and so on. So there was a great deal more interaction, both in the matter of living, but also interaction socially. So you get more complex dealings between people, more interconnectedness. You see for the first time the beginnings of exchange of exotic items like seashells which are traded from the Atlantic coast and the Mediterranean far into the interior. So the world's getting more complex. The human brain is envisaging all sorts of new opportunities. We see this, and of course, as I've said so many times before, archaeologists deal with the material. We see this in the blade technology which allowed the development of all manner of specialized tools. Some only used very locally. There's a form of beautifully made point flaked on both sides by applying pressure to the edge of the point, which is used very largely and confined mostly to southwestern France and is unknown in Eastern Europe. 
Then there was this enormous elaboration of bone and antler technology, especially for hunting weapons. And here again you see something new, personal ornamentation. As we will see later in this course, there was tremendous importance placed on personal ornamentation and rank. But for the first time here, you begin to see people wearing bear's teeth, seashells, and other ornaments which may have been not only symbols of perhaps a kin group you belong to or just personal vanity, but beginning to show status and ceremonial status and so on. Because the other thing that happens here was that art begins to explode and religious beliefs become much more prominent in society, a topic we will address in much more detail in the next lecture. The late Ice Age was at its height 18,000 years ago. Human social relations were now completely reconstructed, with, we suspect, much greater importance being placed both on individual and collective identity, which is where ornaments may have come in, with much greater importance being placed on ties of kin, relationships of obligation to people living in other bands, and on relationships with the supernatural, which is something again we'll talk about in the next lecture. The point is that for the first time we really can see important regional differences in European societies reflected in the artifacts they used and the animals they hunted and the territories they occupied. There's becoming more cultural diversity. To a considerable extent, this is a reflection of the ability of modern humans to adapt to different challenges and de develop not only general but unique solutions to problems of living in widely contrasting and often challenging environments. Late Ice Age Europe was a region with very diverse food resources, including a remarkable range of game animals, most of which are no longer present in Europe. As I've said, the Cro-Magnon staple was the reindeer, which they hunted and killed and stored the meat of in large quantities, returning again and again to the same locations and rock shelters year after year. But they also took other formidable animals, like the wild primordial ox, or aurochs, Bos primigenius, the primeval ox, a formidable frisky beast which only became extinct in Poland in A.D. 1647. 27, I beg your pardon. The bison, the steppe bison, was another formidable animal. Then they took numerous smaller animals, the red deer and arctic fox, many of which provided specialized items like fur. The most formidable animals of all were the cave bear, the woolly rhinoceros, and the mammoth. And even these they hunted sometimes. They certainly painted and engraved them. So, they had a lot of game resources, which were relatively predictable, and an ample cushion of other foods if the reindeer migrations of spring and fall were smaller than usual. There were summer plant foods, there were even sea mammals if you were near the coast, and there were fish. They were beginning to exploit other animals. They had a degree of economic stability unknown in earlier times, because they had the ability to plan to store, to schedule, and to think. They were not nearly such opportunistic hunters as the Neanderthals or Homo erectus. Seasonal salmon runs were an important food resource, and many large rock shelters in the Lazazy region of southwestern France were located near salmon streams. Judging from modern analogies, they harvested salmon by the thousand and dried them for later use. Plant foods were abundant in spring, summer, and fall. 
The point about the Cro-Magnons is that they exploited all these food resources with great efficiency, to the point that many bands lived almost permanently in one place, moving out when there were migrations. But always coming back to the same bases, many of them large caves and rock shelters, using open camps in the summer, a far great, greater versatility of human settlement. And of course, they were perfectly capable of living out in open camps year round. Most rock shelters in sheltered valleys were close to large streams or fords where reindeers crossed rivers or salmon ran. As much as possible, they settled in south-facing caves. Why? So they could get the full warmth of the winter sun. This was a much more complicated existence. The seasons passed and there were events each season. The highlight of the Cro-Magnon year was the summer, probably when neighboring groups came together to specific locations where game like reindeer or salmon were abundant for a few weeks at a time. This was when the harvest took place. This was the time when marriages arranged, initiation ceremonies were performed, and other highly intense rituals unfolded where group shamans, and we'll talk about shamans next time, told tales and wove spells when the ancestors and the forces of the spiritual world were invoked to ensure the continuity of life. For the first time, we see the spiritual and symbolic re realm impinging on human existence, threatening, offering precedent, bringing people together, giving them a world view and an identity, something mentally that humans apparently have not had before. These seasonal gatherings were also times when people traded, men and women traded artifacts, raw materials, ornaments from afar. Cro-Magnon sites in southwestern France contain such exotic as seashells from the northwest Atlantic coast and the Mediterranean, even shiny amber from northern Europe which had mon modern quality, magic qualities when rubbed. Many of these objects may have fostered gestures of social obligation between individuals and groups. Many Cro-Magnon groups seem to have lived closer to their neighbors than ever before. This was a society where social elaboration, where relationships between people, where symbolic acts were of immense importance, both with kin and with more distant neighbors. Shamans, people who understood and interpreted the spiritual world, were much more important than ever before. The climax of the Cro-Magnons came with the Magdalenian culture of southwestern France, which flourished about 15,000 years ago, the bracket may be 18 to 12, we're not quite sure. It's named after a rock shelter called La Madeleine in France's Vézère Valley. And in this you see the full efflorescence of the magnificent engraving and painting achieved by the Magdalenians. A society adapted to extreme cold, which was about to be exposed to a far warmer and climatically rapid changing, rapidly changing world. The Magdalenian, 15,000 years ago, was the climax of tens of thousands of years of brilliant adaptation by modern humans to an extremely demanding and ever-changing Arctic environment. These people were the epitome of Ice Age humans. In this lecture, we've described the spread of modern humans into Europe, and then the distinctive and increasingly elaborate lifeway developed by the Cro-Magnons. We've described how new antler and bone technology allowed the development of highly specialized toolkits, also of tailored clothing. We've also talked a little bit about the dynamics of Cro-Magnon society, which was far more elaborate than that of the Neanderthals. From here, we need to explore the society in a little more depth. We need to look at this interface between the living and spiritual worlds, at the ceremonies and what we know about them, and about the first art known 
in the world, which illuminates this world like a searchlight. And then in the second half of the next lecture, we'll go in east into Eurasia and deep into Siberia.